بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي السلام عليكم everyone and welcome to this uh, halaka happy to have you all here with us if you're joining if you guys could just move up a little bit so um, or if you're like on the corner come if you're going to join us inshallah all right so today inshallah um, you know we have the topic of um, the spiritual and emotional power of ikhlas, which means sincerity. And the reason I, I chose this topic is because I know it's like a, a topic we're all familiar with and it's something that is the basic of our faith, the basics of our faith basically, right? It's the foundation of everything we do. It's to have sincerity, it's to have ikhlas. But we need to constantly renew our heart to the power of it in our lives, especially in our times today. You know, we live in a time where I feel two things are simultaneously happening at the same time when it comes to sincerity. One is that sincerity is being minimized, where we are not thinking enough about the, the truthfulness behind our intentions. But also, simultaneously, I think what's happening is that we're becoming too confident in our sincerity. <laughs> So we'll heal, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard for phrases of like, you know, I'm so sincere, like, you know, this is, this is truly sincere, sincere, right? We say things like this, like, or that I'm 100% sure of my sincerity. People have come to a point where they don't, they think that self-doubt on any level is bad. But I can tell you that a little self-doubt is healthy. That if you are 100% sure every single time of your intention you're not leaving room for what you do not know <laughs> because we are limited right you don't you won't know yourself a hundred percent like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you you might even be veiled from aspects about yourself that only Allah knows about you that's why like after you know after we do any action there's a reason why we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us we say you know may, may Allah accept we say this after Ramadan, we say this after, you know, when we uh, pray in Jama'ah, you say, we say taqabbal Allah, right? We tell the person next to us, may Allah accept. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us, to accept all our acts of worship. Why do we do that? Because we cannot, we're not 100% sure of what was 100% sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sincerity is the foundation of our faith. And so Imam al-Ghazali, rahimallah, he says, all people shall perish, save the knowing. And all the knowing shall perish, save those who act. And all those who act shall perish, except the sincere. Okay? So the first level is what? Those who have knowledge. But then he takes it up to another level. And all the, and all the knowing, now even those who have knowledge shall perish, save those who act, meaning who act upon their knowledge. But then how about those who act? All those who act shall perish except those who are sincere. And then he goes on to say, but the sincere, they face a great danger. He says, for action, amal, or amal, sorry, for action, amal without intention, niyyah, is drudgery, like hard and, and, and dull work. Whereas intention without sincerity, ikhlas, is ostentation, like showing off. And he says that's equal to hypocr hypocrisy and disobedience, right? So he, so basically what he's saying here is that it's not a just about doing good deeds. <laughs> and it's not even just about setting an intention. It's about the value of the intention you're setting. The sincerity of the intention you're setting. And he even says that sincerity without truthfulness is like scattered dust. And here's the thing, I want you just to take alone the concept of truth, right? You can't grow in the absence of truth. You can't change, transform, or make an impact on anything in the absence of truth. If you're attached to something false, if you're attached, attached to your own false delusions, if you're attached to false beliefs, if you're attached to anything that is not true, you can't really grow. Even when we, you know, let's take the, the, the process of of healing a person can't heal if they're detached from truth <laughs> they actually have to face truth no matter how uncomfortable no matter how painful 
healing requires that you connect to truth. That's what allows a person to grow. That's what allows a person to actually heal. And so on our path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our purpose is to ensure every step of the way that we do not have any, um, do not give anything the same value as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's what shirk is, right? You give something the same value as the one who created you. So shirk is not just, oh, you, you know, you associate partners with Allah or like, or in the sense that you say like, oh, he has a son or he has, uh, you know, a, a partner or there's another Lord. No, shirk is also that you give anything the same value as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You put anything at, on the same pedestal that you put Allah, you give, you prioritize that thing as you would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or astaghfirullah even more. Like the opinions of others. Is Allah's opinion greater to you or the people's opinion? And so in every moment, you see throughout, just take, it, take a day. Throughout the day, we're constantly engaging in actions. We have a million opportunities to cultivate sincerity, to cultivate ikhlas, where we devote this heart sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we, where through that action, we are, the heart is accepting the reality that no one is greater but Allah. Sincerity in our actions is seeking Allah's pleasure and Allah's approval and Allah seeing you and Allah hearing you and Allah accepting that deed above anything else. And so as we know, per the hadith that the scholars say, you know, constitutes a third of our faith, is the hadith of, um, where the Prophet Sallallahu he says that that verily our actions are by our intentions. But then he also says after that, Verily, every person will get what only what they intended. And I think the second part is is so remarkable, right? Is that like, it's not just that your actions are by your intentions. It's that you will get what you intended. So what does that mean? Allah will meet you as far as your heart, as far as what your heart brings. Which goes back to Hadith Qudsi where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am what my servant thinks of me. And this is such a powerful gift in our faith because Allah doesn't judge us based on the outcome of our actions. He judges us based on what? The, the, the heart behind the action. And of course our efforts, our efforts, our intentions and our efforts. But he never placed the outcome in, in our responsibility. We did that on our own. We oftentimes actually do the opposite. We forget about our intentions. We forget about connecting to our intentions. The truthfulness, remember Imam al-Ghazali said, sincerity without truthfulness, without sitq, is like scattered dust. You know, what is the truth behind your action? And if you're disconnected from that, Many times we're disconnected from the truth behind our action, then our heart is cons- our, mind, our mind and heart is consumed with what? How is the action going to be, you know, going to land? <laughs> you know, how is, what's the outcome? What are people going to say? What's the end result? We're so consumed in the future. But intentions actually connect you to the present. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking you to stay in the here and now. Just stay in the moment. That's all I'm asking you to do. Just what is your intention? And... What are the efforts that you're going to put to follow through on that intention? How are you going to follow that intention with action? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ask us to be responsible for the outcome of that action. But in our world today, I can tell you, in this like, you know, world where we're constantly led by our minds. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? We're, we're led by our nafs. We, we don't like uncertainty, we don't like discomfort. What's gonna happen, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? But a powerful thing happens when you just say, well, wait, 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 what is my intention? <laughs> Please tell me that's not a bee. Okay, I hear it buzzing. <laughs> okay, I think it went to you guys. <laughs> but um, a powerful thing happens when you just pause and you say, what was my intention? Essentially what you're asking is, 
What is the truth behind this action I'm doing? Why did I even do it? Why am I even doing it? Why am I even about to do it? <laughs> what is the value? What am I seeking here? You know when you take time to pause and ask, ask yourself these questions? You take back your power <laughs> that you put outside of you to determine how you feel. So let's say like, you know, you want to do a nice thing for someone and you're worried about how they're going to react or, or you're hoping they give you this certain reaction and you're thinking, well, what if they don't give me that reaction or what if they respond negatively or what if they don't, you know, show gratitude? What if they don't appreciate me? What if, you know, you start like spiraling and then you, you pause and you say, wait, 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 why am I even doing this? <laughs> Like, hold on, assess your sitk. What is the truth behind why I'm even doing this nice thing for my friend or for my loved one or for my family? And then you say, you know what? Maybe I'm doing it so they can say, oh, this and this and this, <laughs> you know? Or maybe I'm doing it so they can maybe return something. Maybe you're looking for them to do something for you, right? And then you realize, you know what? my intentions are not in the right place <laughs> then maybe I'm not doing it just for the sake of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and him seeing me do something good for his creation <laughs> because then when you do that what happens is is that you're not waiting for the people you're waiting for Allah <laughs> and Allah is always you know never fails in his promise what happens is you're setting your heart up to receive from the one who has an infinite supply of what you need, not the people who are limited and their hands have nothing to offer you. <laughs> it, you take back your power and you actually do feel like, okay, I, I, I kind of, I'm connecting now to what I'm actually in control of. <laughs> because that's what happens when you start thinking about all the outcomes is you feel powerless. You're at the mercy of all the possibilities that could happen. <laughs> You know, and it's the same thing with whether you're applying, you know, I know a lot of you are, you know, graduating or have graduated, you know, you, you're applying to certain things and you don't, you don't know, you know, what's going to happen. Okay, connect. Okay. What is in my control? Okay, my sincerity. Why am I applying to this place? What am I seeking? And is that, is that thing that you are seeking even tied to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because that's what the intention setting is. Many people will often say, like, what does it mean to set an intention for the sake of Allah? Right? It means that as you, before you do this action, you are looking for how the one you claimed is your highest value is going to be pleased with this action. How he is a priority through this action. I mean, how through this action you are prioritizing him. So you're asking yourself questions like, how is what I'm doing pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How is this place that I'm applying to, this action I'm about to do, how is it in service of my creator? Because you cannot have two lords. <laughs> Just as you can't have two leaders of any, of, can, you, can you have two leaders of a country? <laughs> They'd be like, what's going on, <laughs> right? You have to, you know, you always, whenever there's two leaders, there's always chaos. And the, the heart can only have one realm one Lord you know I always remember when I was young I asked my mother one time I said you know is music haram I remember asking her this like is, is music haram you know you you hear like different opinions and I heard that you know music is haram and my mom she could have said yeah music is haram stay away from it right but she said something very powerful that always stuck with me and she said Marwa you only have one heart you either spend it Remembering Allah, or you fill it with Allah, or you fill it with good music, right? And so she, she's not necessarily saying, don't listen. But what she did was she, was she made me aware of the choice that I have to care for my heart. It's not, about, it's not necessarily about in that moment is, sometimes we fixate, is it halal or haram, right? Sometimes we fixate on things that we're not sure of. It's halal or haram. But we don't ask ourselves questions like, is it good for my heart? <laughs> and you know, I would notice, subhanAllah, when I would spend a lot of time when I was young listening to music, 
I'll get to a point where I feel like, oh my God, like I just feel like constricted. And then I noticed that the times when I would stay away from music or some, or stay away from anything, you, you could replace this with, you know, any, any habit that you have, whether it's like your highest priority is like video gaming. Your highest priority is listening to music. You know, when you're in high school, it's all people talk about, right? Like, you know, what are you listening to? People used to ask me this. I was always behind on popular, what is it? Pop culture. <laughs> so, you know, People, I, what do you like? What what songs are you listening to? And I, I used to be like, I don't know. I don't. I'm not listening to anything, you know. But when I got into music, I was like thinking about it. I'm like, Subhanallah, you know, the more that I fill my heart with it, the less I remember Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And the more that I remember Allah and I fill this heart with Allah, the less that I wanted to listen to music. So it wasn't necessarily haram halal, right? That I was, I could be right identifying that's not i mean that's not the discussion right now i'm not a i'm not a, a scholar of fiqh right so i'm not here to give rulings but what i'm saying is is that it goes beyond that at times where you're like is it even is this act or is this thing that i'm filling my heart with is it even good for me is it going to bring me closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know and so when my mother told me this i i wasn't i was more thinking of you know how to take care of my heart in that moment and think okay well i have a heart to take care of and i have a heart that is designed to seek allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's what sincere that's what ikhlas is is that you're devoted you're high what is devotion and i've spoken about this before that devotion or worship they're synonymous right it's what you make your highest value and so a lot of times you know, when someone says they're devoted to someone, you know, it means what? They're giving everything to that person. <laughs> and so devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He is your highest priority in everything that you're doing. And that you're seeking from Him the most more than you're seeking from anyone else. And so part of our faith and this is in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is we who sent down the scripture to you with the truth. So worship Allah with your total devotion, total, complete. True devotion is due to Allah alone. Many, many verses that speak about devotion. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, O oh people, make your deeds sincere for Allah Almighty. Verily, Allah does not accept any deed unless it's done sincerely for him. Do not say this is for the sake of Allah and this is for the sake of my relatives. Verily, it was done for your relatives and none of it was for Allah. <laughs> and do not say this is for the sake of Allah and for your sake. Verily, it was done for their sake and none of it was for Allah. And so this is sometimes a little hard to understand or heavy to understand because we're like, well, aren't we not allowed to do good things for people we love? No, no, of course, you do good things for the people you love. But as you are doing it, who is your greatest priority? <laughs> who are you, who is your heart direct, directed towards as you're doing that action? Who are you seeking? Who do you want to receive from? Whose reward are you, are you, are you longing for? <laughs> and which world is your priority? Is it your final home or is it this temporary world? Sincerity has a lot to do with our remembrance of the Akhirah. And without that remembrance, without our remembrance of the hereafter, you, we actually become less sincere. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, remember our servants Abraham, Ishaq, uh, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub, all men of strength and vision. We cause them to be devoted to us through their sincere remembrance of the final home with us they will be among the elect the truly good the part here is that we cause them to be devoted to us through their sincere remembrance of the final home the eye of their heart is on where their soul belongs and that's what increases our sincerity if all we see is this world then the people's opinions, the people's judgments, the people's reactions, the people's lack of appreciation, the people not seeing us, not making us feel heard, not making us feel 
whatever, right? Like whatever we are seeking from the people, it's going to be so much more exacerbated. Whatever you don't get in this world is going to be so much more exacerbated. You know, my teacher used to always say that ikhlas is hard, sincerity is hard, because the nafs does not get a share. And it's true. We live in a world where we think we can do two things and be sin like we can feed the nafs and the heart and be sincere. <laughs> like for example, and this is happening because of social media, right? Doing a good deed, giving charity to a homeless person, I'm gonna post about it. <laughs> but it's, it's, for, it's for a good deed because you know, it's gonna incur, you find ways to justify how you could satisfy your nafs and your heart at the same time, but it won't work. Sincerity doesn't work that way. So remember this, ikhlas, sincerity is hard because the nafs does not get a share. The nafs is like, what about me? What about my self-importance? What about me rec be recognized for what I'm doing? What about this? What about that? You know? And then you're like, no, shh. <laughs> I always use the sh sound when we're talking about like um, our nafs because you do have to shush it. You do. You have to say, shh, I'm not listening to you right now. <laughs> Yes, yes, I know you want self-importance, shh. <laughs> yes, yes, but just post about it, it'll be okay, you know, we're gonna encourage so many people to go to this homeless person and give or go, shh. I want my deed to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And so this is the battle we're always in, is that the nafs always wants a share of our action. And you're always saying, no, I want my heart to have the full share. I want it to be sincerely for God. And the best way we can do that is to engage in actions that only you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know about. Which is something we need to do so much more of in our world, especially in this oversharing world we're in. Are more of your good deeds only known by you and Allah? Of course there's benefit to, you know, um, sharing good deeds at times, you know, even when it comes to charity, there's benefit in, in we, we know that the Sahaba used to give charity in private, but also publicly. But are more of your good deeds, is your priority more that only Allah sees you? Because no matter how strong you are, like in faith, even those moments when you are like being, um, even if you, let's say you have the right intention, the nafs can get the best of us. We're human, you know? And so, even then we have to okay let me make up for this like because we don't know is it accepted or not we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may Allah accept it but let me engage in more actions that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about you know one of the fastest ways to increase ikhlas and to feel like a boost of iman if you're ever feeling like you know you feel heavy-hearted or you feel like um, you just start to feel like you're far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of the fastest ways to get an iman boost is to go do an action that only you and Allah know about. Like, go help someone, don't tell anyone. Don't even tell your mom, I'm going there to, even if it's like, like innocent, I'm going there to help someone. Don't even, don't even say it. <laughs> you know, or like, don't just do something that you can only keep between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And watch what it does for your heart. Because in that moment, your nafs does not get a share. The heart can be full. This is what we say is like, you know, wholehearted living, or you you are living heartfully, is now you're filling the heart. The nafs always wants a share of what you're doing for the heart. And when you don't give it a share, your heart gets all of it. Your heart gets to be nourished. It gets to walk away feeling sufficed. But we don't give ourselves enough moments of that. Because it's, we're always programmed that something only matters when it is seen by others. You know, our work only matters when it is visible by others. And I see this all the time. Like, you know, when I work with, uh, for example, you know, new mothers, a lot of times I work with mothers who become really, who get really down at the fact that, you know, they don't get to be visible because they're busy mothering, right? or that they don't get to be, you know, where they want to be in their careers. And it's, it has to do with this, like, but I'm just here, I'm just, I'm just a mom. 
but even though this work is not seen by say your colleagues or you know in your field it's seen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is visible it's very visible but we have learned we've programmed to give value to something only when it's visible you know I was talking to someone recently about leadership and how oftentimes we're programmed to think that leadership is only leadership when you're leading a lot of people when you're visible when you are you know at the center of it all that's not always leadership leadership can be on the ground serving two people could be unseen by people it could be just seen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a few select doesn't take away from the impact of the leadership and so there's a there's actually a quote it says you know when we die I don't I'm gonna probably butcher it but um, it says when we die we don't want to be wait hold on what is it like we don't want to just be known by the people right like our oh something like our character is not what the people say about us it's what the angels say about us <laughs> right and how many of us even think about what the angels are writing about us that's that fuels sincerity what is the angel on the right writing what is the angel on the left writing you know many times we we really um, we forget all the things that are happening in the ghaib in the unseen like you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being present with us Allah, Allah is al hayyu qayyum right he's the ever living self sustaining he's always with us as samia al basir the all hearing the all seeing you know as human beings we want to, one of our innate needs is to be seen and heard it's not a coincidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always tells us that he is a sami al basir so we always feel heard and seen because that's a psychological need but if we live without trying to cultivate sincerity without taking time to assess what is the truthfulness what is the sitq behind our actions what is the sitq behind our sincerity remember as imam ghazali uh, rahimahullah he said that intention can't be he even says intention is the spirit of the action but you can't intention still require sincerity and sincerity requires truthfulness sitq are you truthful with yourself are you truthful about the why you are doing something and you know the best way to know you know oftentimes through trial and error what your intentions are how you react when you don't get the outcome that you wanted <laughs> you know that's and sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us through those experiences where we're like oh okay I'm upset because my intentions were not sincere I told myself that I was doing it for Allah but you know what this shows me my reaction is showing me that I wasn't doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we also want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with actions that have value in the world that is permanent <laughs> that is eternal and that's one of the greatest ways to fuel our connection to ikhlas and our connection to sincerity is what if I meet and ask ourselves we should ask ourselves this question what if I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I say I did this ya Allah for you or I did this and I did this and he says no you didn't do it for me <laughs> so that's the spiritual realm how does lack of sincerity impact us on a mental and emotional level it creates inner conflict remember how I said you can't have two leaders why because there would be chaos you can't have two highest values within your heart you can't claim Allah is your highest value and then you know um, intend for two for two things that's what creates inner conflict it's this tug of war. You're you're like, okay, I wanna I wanna serve Allah, but I also want my nafs to get a share. I wanna feel good. I wanna feel important. I wanna feel whatever it is that the nafs is seeking at the time. So what happens is for a lot of people is that they they're not at peace. And notice this within yourself. You are most at peace when you are 100% sure that your intentions, not 100%, but you're, you're like, you're devoted, I know, right? I said, don't be 100%. But when you are devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you're like, your priority is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the end, of course, you know, the reason why, you know, you guys are smiling, so I said before, we should never be 100% sure of our sincerity, but we ask Allah to accept it, right? 
And that's how we kind of check ourselves at the end. May Allah accept it. Ya Allah, if there's any shortcomings in this action, please forgive me for it. But you are most at peace when you do something seeking from Allah alone. Because it, it protects you. Allah is not in need of sincere actions, right? Allah does not need our acts of worship. But it serves you. Because when you do something devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, you know how much decluttering happens when you do that? You have literally disconnected yourself from the future. You're in the moment. You're like, my intention is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's going to take care of the rest. You have let go, relinquished this responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not ask you to, to burden yourself with. He did not burden you with the outcome. You know, in uh, Surah Taha, there's a beautiful verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I think I, I mentioned this before, but not in this context, but at the end of Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions, he, he, he tells us, do not look longingly at what we have given other people to enjoy from this worldly life. You know, after he tells us, do not look longingly, and he, he just, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this, this is something that he tests people with. These things that we could look longingly at, we say, why don't I have that? You know, afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the following verses, he says, we do not ask you to provide. We provide for you. I never placed you providing for yourself in your responsibility. That's my responsibility. <laughs> but we do the opposite. But when you cultivate ikhlas and it's a muscle, it's something that we have to constantly work at, what happens is, is that you begin decluttering mentally, emotionally, and internally from a lot of things that you're attached to. You see, we often look at ikhlas as this like, just like as this religious obligation, you know? <laughs> where we view it in a very heavy way. Oh, if I'm not sincere, I'm gonna to go to hell, right? So everything that Islam teaches us serves us holistically, not just for our akhirah, but also in our dunya. When we are sincere, we don't, we're not, um, there isn't this constant questioning of th this conflict, this chaos within you. Right? You're like, you're, you're clear, you have more clarity, you have more direction because you're aware of who your direction is. But you also didn't, don't give a lot of energy to things that are not in line with your intention. You know many times when people have reactions that are disproportionate to like the outcome of what they intended for? It's because they're disconnected from why they're even doing something. And I'll see this many times in like my work with clients, like when there's a situation, there's a conflict or something, I'll say like, well, what are you really upset about? <laughs> or like, you know, trying to really get them to connect to the truth behind what was happening. Oftentimes, when we're disconnected from ourselves, our reactions are bigger. <laughs> we project more. We become angrier. But when you connect to yourself and you actually know the truth behind <coughs> your actions, you become more grounded. You become more settled. You are more concerned with the value you are seeking, the truth, and you are settled in the fact that you are striving for authenticity. You're not striving to monitor the impression of, of people of you. People spend so much energy in this. I'm gonna, I, need, I need to make sure that people perceive me a certain way. It's called monitoring the impression of other people. So when you do the work of sincerity, it, it makes you walk this earth lighter. I mean, think of, think of just within your own lives, like how much energy you can give at times to the opinions of others, to what someone might say, to what someone might do, to how they're thinking of you, to over explaining yourself. Oh, I need to make sure that they know this about me or they know, they know why I did this thing. You know how many times, right? I work a lot of times with people who struggle with over explaining, right? Think about just the concept of like over explaining. It's like you're always, you always want to make sure that people know what? Your heart. <laughs> Think of a time you over explained to someone. What were you trying to do? Anybody? Come on, I'm sure we all, we all engaged in over explaining. So, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you repeat? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
exactly you want to prove that's what she, she was saying that you want to prove your intentions were good many of us engage in over explaining i just want you to know that i did this because of this because of this i just want you to know i only wanted the best you know all these things right like because we want a human being to know that we are good inside or to understand the why behind our actions and and isn't it exhausting when we do that it's like when you walk away from over explaining how many of you feel great about yourselves mm -hmm. you don't feel great you feel depleted you feel like you lost energy you feel like you feel weaker to be honest with you because you feel like why am I giving so much power to this one person? <laughs> okay, and let's say they did misunderstand me. Why is that not okay? <laughs> you know, one of the greatest superpowers is being okay with being misunderstood. But you know how you can cultivate that superpower? By cultivating ikhlas. <laughs> By cultivating sincerity. The more that you Allah is your highest priority that you are seeking Allah the more that Allah is who you are setting yourself up to receive from when you're doing an action the more likely that you are going to cultivate the superpower of being okay with people having a negative impression of you of people misunderstanding you of people not always having an image of you that you want them to have because Allah never put that in our responsibility people will view you to the extent of their own psychology their own thoughts their own heart their own their own journey <laughs> their own life their own lens and you can't control that and I'm sure we've all had experiences where no matter what you do you can still be perceived in the wrong way and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us these like experiences for us to see to, to understand these lessons because it's actually in those moments when you do everything right <laughs> and someone reacts negatively to you that it forces you to say, well, wait, what is my intention? Why, you know, okay, alhamdulillah, Allah knows my intention. Right? So ikhlas is just, is so powerful. And I, I do have to, um, you know, stop here. I'll take a few, couple of questions. But yeah, I just wanted to, you know, remind myself first and all of you to take time to just it's just these little moments where you're about to do an action. Why am I doing it? What is the truth behind it? What is my intention? Taking these little moments to ask these simple questions. How is what I'm about to do pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How is what I'm about to do, you know, gonna set me up to receive a reward not from the people but from Allah? And the more you do it, the more you feel empowered to do it again because you'll see how the heart react so positively to ikhlas okay i'll take a couple of questions and then we'll um yes you mentioned uh there's there's always this question if i share it would encourage other people to do mm -hmm. it too oh about the posting thing yeah yeah about posting or yeah. you know you're doing something or you're sharing something or an experience you had or even a religious experience you you're sharing it yeah so that it could help other people Mm -hmm. But how do you check that if that is what you're doing or if it's actually you just want people to know? Yeah. You know how, I, how do you check yourself? Yeah. Again, I'm not saying to never like share something good that you're doing, but I what I'm saying <coughs> is that most more of our good deeds should be done only with only Allah knowing. Because that's what keeps us in check. Mm -hmm. You know. Um I think that in the moments when you do a good deed, you're and you're used to like say sharing it your nafs is going to have a really hard time with you not sharing. Mm. So look for moments where you can make your nafs uncomfortable because in those moments you're like, but share, just, you know, it's okay, go, you're getting good deeds. Say no, shh, <laughs> you know, like, it's okay. My heart needs this. And, and that's what we need. We need to create more moments where our heart gets a full share of the deed. But we're always giving, we're always letting the nafs rob us, you know, and we benefit, we, we, suffer from that because then we don't get nourished by our actions like good actions by the way like good deeds like charity um giving from our money giving from our time giving from our wealth uh being good to people smiling all of these things like anything good that you do you know 
does Allah get anything from it? He doesn't. So what it, how does it, it serves us, it nourishes us, where the heart is designed to react, to respond positively to good deeds <laughs> because it nourishes us. So imagine if every time you're like telling the heart, no, I'm not gonna give you all of it. I'm gonna go give my nafs. You're gonna walk up around emptier, not as nourished. And this is what's happening. You know, we live in a world where we go outward a lot and going inward is discouraged. So if you're always going outward, and trust me, like trial and error, do a good deed, tell no one about it. You're gonna wanna do more of that. Do a good deed, tell people about it. Check in with your heart, see how you feel. That's what's gonna tell you. Oh yeah, dopa a dopamine rush, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, I mean, I think that you know we live in a dopamine pushing world so like um they actually say like we live in a time where you actually have to i mean this is something islam teaches but because of how much dopamine like rushes we're constantly getting i mean the second you even post something and you get a like that's a dopamine rush or you go on social media or you anything that you do that like makes you instantly feel good is giving you a dopamine rush once your brain on a like on a neurological level once your brain gets addicted to that it's very hard to break that cycle so what breaks that cycle is allowing your mo allowing yourself times where you're uncomfortable and you delay instant gratification i want to go on my phone it's okay i don't need to right now and you sit and do that hmm? it's too hard <laughs> yeah it's hard but the more you do it you you realize it's power Thank you always for this talk. No it's such a nice space to uh, create here. Uh, you mm -hmm. brought up just the, the classic, the gold standard relatives mm -hmm. versus like, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Am I doing this to please my family? Am I doing this to please Allah? Mm -hmm. Allah, Allah. So, you know, just curious about like, there are a lot of very explicit Islamic teachings around being mm -hmm. respectful to your parents, obedient to your parents. Obviously, as you observe in your work, that lands a lot of people in uh, uncomfortable situations. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. just curious if you could expand upon, you know, understanding. Islamically, like the role of being a good family member, a good son. Yeah. When, you know, keeping that intention pure, when it can get kind of twisted up by yeah. you know, your relatives. Yeah, well, you know, parents in the Arabic language, we call them Rabb al Bayt, right? But they're not Rabb al Adameen. <laughs> and that's the thing, our parents, they're not, they're not our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is actually like, um, you know, something we have to keep in mind that. Pleasing them is is not to give them the same value that we give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Obviously. But yes, you're it's it's so it's like sincerity is not that you're not connected to the good you're doing for your family. I think people often can I'm not saying you are, but I think often people confuse that. It's like they become like robotic and sometimes like cold when they think like this is what for the sake of Allah means, right? And it by the way, for the sake of Allah doesn't mean that you go and you do something good for your parents, say, I'm doing it for the sake of Allah. Right? Or you go do something nice for someone and doing it for the sake of Allah. We get into this habit, right? Where like we feel like in order for us to do something for the sake of Allah, we have to say it, we have to claim it. And I see this a lot of times when people like start practicing and then the way they treat their parents sometimes, it becomes like very robotic and very like, you know, uh, well, for the sake of, you know, <laughs> for the sake of Allah. But no, we're not, when we are, when we intend for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not disconnected from the beauty that it's bringing to our parents and we're not we're not disconnected from the impact of our action but again this is why i'm very specific about how i use the language of like for the sake of allah because i i usually say that it's just ensuring that allah is your highest priority in that moment and who you're receiving from is the highest priority allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who you are seeking the most from is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but it's not that you don't long to see a smile on your parents face you know we're human of course you know Okay. Yes. Um, so, in terms of you kind of relating how the sincerity of our actions and our hearts mm -hmm. are intertwined, um, I have a very close friend of mine who herself is experiencing the ebbs and flows of her Eva, mm -hmm. and I remember her telling me that there comes a point where it's like the point of no return for her or like almost like rock bottom with her Iman where she feels like 
even when she does engage in acts of prayer or charity, um, if it's done in private, um, she feels like her heart is removed. Um, and that she did describe her heart to be kind of like hard and not soft anymore. Um, and so when she is praying, she feels like she's going through the motions of prayer, but um, she doesn't feel like it's having an effect on her heart and her iman. Um, so I guess my question is, what would it take for the process of someone's heart to become soft again? Like from being hard and removed to now being soft and present. What would that look yeah. like the first step? It's the trick, one of my teachers, he said, you have to be patient with your nafs. No, sorry, you have to be patient with your heart as you were patient with your nafs. We spend so much time feeding our nafs, feeding our nafs, feeding our nafs, while our heart becomes more malnourished, 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 more covered with barriers and barriers and barriers. And then once we want to not feel that way anymore, we want the heart to snap. <laughs> okay, start feeling. So we're, we're pa so patient when we're fueling our nafs, forgetting about God, neglecting our duties, neglecting our daily Quran, our daily dhikr. And then once we want to like bring this heart back to life, essentially, we expect it to be instantaneous. And it's a lack of sabr and it's saying okay my heart is hard right now and okay i i it feels heavy to carry but i'm going to be patient with it as i was patient with my nuts actually i'm going to i'm going to be patient even more with my heart because it's more deserving of my patience than my nuts was my nuts didn't need me to be this patient but my heart does and so even in those moments, you know, I see this all the time, like whether it's Ramadan or we go to Umrah or, you know, uh, any time like we're in a place where we, we want to feel now we're ready to be spiritual. And I've experienced, experienced this in my, on my own path, right? Where like, there are times where I'm like, why is my heart not, you know, like feeling, right? And like, let's say I went to a retreat and I wanted to like feel the, the spiritual high. And this is why I teach seek Allah not the spiritual high this is something I learned very powerfully from my own path as I was always wondering why am I like it's like a roller coaster every time I felt like close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I would lose it and I asked this question for for a few years until I got the answer you know of like seek Allah not the spiritual high so when you begin like devoting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be patient with your heart and remember you are seeking him, not the feeling, not the high. The high comes and goes, you know. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, going back to the question a couple of questions ago, uh, the monitoring other people's impressions of it is like upstream and um, so like we I mean, you know a lot of us like come from cultures where like it's like almost an obsession, especially like, with our parents mm -hmm. who grew up in other countries where like what other people think of us is like incredibly important, it's like an obsession. So how do you navigate that when other people like your parents are making, um, like they could be behaving or making decisions about your life mm -hmm. that take what other, like they're not the most, well, I don't, I shouldn't say they're not the most sincere, but like they're, it's very reflective of how much they think about what other people think. So how do you navigate? So just so I can make sure I got this right, like so when parents are more like concerned with like the impression of people. Yeah. And you're exactly. trying to like stay sincere in your actions, is what you're saying. Exactly. And well, how do you navigate that when especially when they're making decisions about your life? Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> yeah, I, w I wish I had like a, an answer for that. That's tough. I mean I it, you know, I know I know it can be very difficult and it can feel um, like you're trapped, right? When you, you're dealing with parents who are making decisions for you. I am a proponent of communication. That communication is not res disrespect towards parents. Um, and I believe that when you're an adult, you should still be able to communicate just because you say like, you know, this, this is not something that I think will be good for me, especially if it's not good, especially when it comes to obviously things for your dean, right? Like you, you never want to, and we're not, we're not allowed to um, you know, 
displease Allah by pleasing the parents, right? Like that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes first, but even in the gray area and the things that don't necessarily impact our deen, like we have a right to communicate. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't take that right away from us. But it's just the matter, man, the manner in which we communicate. Like, can you still have compassion and mercy towards your parent even as you're communicating, you know? Um, and can you try to understand their perspective but still stay firm and true to your values and what you're trying to cultivate? Because a lot of times parents are coming from a cultural lens and sometimes could be coming from a toxic lens as well, you know, that isn't necessarily aligned with what is best for you in the dunya or the akhra, you know? So it, it is hard. I, I don't have, I'm not claiming to have an easy solution, but I think that you know, especially when you're, I think many people, many times when people grow up with parents like this, they actually struggle with like not being able to put boundaries and not being able to communicate. So speaking to a counselor that can help you build those skills is really powerful because sometimes we enmesh like, oh, if I show, if I like, if I disagree or if I communicate, oh, that means I'm a bad Muslim. Like, like unlearning these false beliefs are so important and many people are guided by them. So then when they speak up for themselves, even if they spe you know, spoke in a respectful manner, guess what happens? So much shame. So much shame. I'm a bad Muslim, I'm this, and that shame cripples people. And I'm not talking about the healthy kind of shame in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I always say, you know, you could take anything. With Allah, it's a beautiful thing. With the people, it can be really harmful. Like, toxic, like to shame, for example. In front of Allah, shame is a beautiful thing. Like you having that humility in front of Him. But shame with the people can be very toxic. Um, I, I teach codependency, for example. I tell my students, codependency with Allah is beautiful. Be codependent with Allah, you know. But codependency with the people can be harmful. It can create a lot of struggle for you. But yeah, I think anyone, to anyone in this room is struggling with like, you know, speaking to parents or navigating boundaries, that's a skill that many of us, especially if we grew up around like Middle Eastern parents or Asian parents or parents from a different culture weren't raised in the same culture as ours, even just talking about filtering that what what's what is okay with like Islam and what is you know what is something that I can work on you know emotionally and communication wise you know and being able to cultivate that as well okay all right oh yes well, okay do we have time for one more or okay one more question um, so how would you go about selecting like the sounds really mechanical but like you have um, multiple different actions that are sincere and that they can be done for God's sake but how do you prioritize them I guess multiple actions or multiple intentions for one action multiple actions that you both you try to make all these different acts like you can see them as being sincere but mm -hmm. you can't do them all like you can only yeah. do one or the other <laughs> oh okay so that's it's a matter of just figuring out which to choose like both can be good for in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> I mean, that, then that comes to a matter of figuring out what is the most in service of you and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that case, you're trying to figure out what is the best choice and that's where istikhara comes, out, comes in, right? Is that you're asking, you're still even, even when you're confused about which action to take, even though both actions can be rooted in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're doing istikhara because you're saying, I don't know what's best for me. Help me decide which action is best. Is best, and that's where it's tough harder because it's right. It's true. You can have you can have two actions that are both good for the sake of Allah, beautiful, but you just don't know which one, right? So I think that's an istikhar is like the guidance prayer. So it's where we pray like two rakahs for those who don't know, pray two rakahs and then you say the istikhar dua. If you look up istikhar, it'll give you like um, explanation for it. Okay, we'll stop here. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much.